The Disciplines of Grace. This is the last in this series, and this one's about joy, celebration. All through the Bible, God called his people to celebrate and stop grouching, to be thinking about what's eternal and what's inside and not just what's outside. Because as I studied Rejoice, we sang four songs about it. The rejoicing was written from prison. It was written when they were in the wilderness, the celebrations for Israel. It was not about how you're doing. It was about your spirit and your connection. Join me in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you would like to look there. 1 Peter chapter 1. In the Pew Bible, it's page 1200. In your phone, it's two flicks from the weather report. <laughs> First Peter. And I'd like to just thank you for the privilege of being here and uh, talking about this huge issue here at Chapel Street. The issue is to think about what's eternal and what really matters in our lives. First of all, happy Labor Day. It's the one, one holiday where you don't do it so you can celebrate it. You stay home and don't go to work. So enjoy that. But go Tuesday, if you would, please. <laughs> Celebrate salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1. He starts off by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's his calling, to those who are elect exiles, that's important, exiles of the dispersion. They're scattered all around. They're in big trouble. If you know church history, some of them are getting killed. Peter, James, they all write about trials. Verse 2 down there at the end of it, he says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he comes back to say why that should be, why we should bless him and rejoice. I'll come right back to that. Verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that, here's the purpose, if you're going through cancer, if you're going through pain, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, every pain we face is a test, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is this? Rejoice in this. Verse 6, in this you rejoice. There's no question but that it's verses 3 to 5. In this, I just said this, Look at verses 3 to 5 now. In this, you greatly rejoice. It's about a word we use maybe too commonly, salvation, but it means you're okay. You're set for eternity. It means made healthy by God, totally forgiven. We understand in the New Testament it means declared righteous by the gift of God. And the source is the mercy of God. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. According to his great mercy. You know how it works if you play this with your neighbors or grandkids. Rock crushes scissors. Paper covers rock. Mercy covers justice. If you don't believe that, you're in big trouble because if we get what we deserve, that's justice. We're all in trouble. According to his great mercy, he covered and took away, actually, all of our sins. The celebration is about the mercy of God. The second phrase that he gives is so important, and it's from new birth. By new birth, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, later he says, he has caused us to be born again. That's a phrase that some people laugh at if they're on comedy late night. But it's a very strong phrase to Jesus Christ. It's much more than just trying Jesus. 
at the chapel one day, uh, I asked a guy how he was doing. I said, I hadn't seen him at church. Actually, it was downtown. I said, I haven't seen him. He said, I quote exactly, I tried Jesus and it did not work. I understood what he meant. A lot of people have done that. A lot of people have prayed a prayer watching television or at the end of Joel Osteen or some other time, and they tried it and it didn't work. A pastor who made famous all kinds of issues about morality just this last month renounced his faith. This is not a light thing. At the center of Jesus Christ's followers is new birth, a new start. As you know, if you've given birth to a baby, birth is very complicated and miraculous. The new birth is not okay. Rather, it's entwining your life with Jesus Christ, celebrating what he has done. Is that you? And living this way then. This new birth is what he's saying. In this, you greatly rejoice. He also says the result, well, it's to be revealed according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The result of new birth is not instant healing. It is not constant joy. It is a living hope that's to be revealed. If you got what we're going to look at in a moment, some of the celebrations in the Old Testament, you were still in the wilderness you had this hope of a new land. Most of them never got there. But they could rejoice in their connection with Jehovah God, and we can, the living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the basis. Now, Peter had seen the resurrection. A living hope to be revealed means it's constantly on your mind, in the back of your mind at least. Every time you read the headlines about war or something else, in the back of your mind, yeah, but we have a living hope, and it's about remaking the world, Jesus the Christ as Lord. And the assurance is going to come, but it's based upon the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Peter saw him. I would think we would all agree that from that day on, his doubts were gone. P Paul saw him, saw the risen Christ in the heavens, in his case. I think he spent time with him and learned and got a quick degree in, in what he should teach. But clearly, once they saw the risen Christ, it was, they were changed. And for those of you that are always worried about your faith, he says it's guarded. Look at, look at the assurance of this. Verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. It's here now, but it's still coming, and it's guarded by our Lord. Don't get into debates over whether you can lose your salvation. Just be guarded by Christ and talk about His security and what He does for you. So this is all of this. Now, I'll remind you, at the front of your building, right here in our worship center, the cross of Jesus Christ, where he died, you know this, with all your sins on his back, not, not 90 percent, not minus tomorrow's sins, with all your sins on his soul, he died and paid for them. And when you put your faith in him, you don't just say, okay, yeah, that's true. George Washington lived, Jesus lived, Jesus rose, Jesus no, you put your faith in Christ. You trust him. He's the object of your salvation hopes. You center your life on trusting him and his righteousness, Romans 4.1, covers you from then on. Is that you? I mean, you don't say, well, boy, I hope so. Knock on wood. No, all sins paid for when you trust him, it counts for you. All his righteousness, did you hear that? All his righteousness covering you as a gift, now live in that combination. That's Peter. That's you. That's what he's saying th this is. What does it mean, though, to rejoice? For here we are. This is our text, verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. 
Rejoice is what we just did. Singing is a big part of God's word to the church. It was to the Old Testament people. Some things you just can't say. How can you say how good it is to be totally forgiven and covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ? To rejoice means to say joy, but it's, it's actually never used in the Greek in secular language I read. They don't use it. There's something special. It's Mary when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She's going to go through a rough time, not just pregnancy, but the mocking of people. My soul rejoices. My soul says, God is good. Is that you? That can be all of us. And when he says, rejoice in the Lord, it's this word, which means celebrate. Not because of what's around you, but to celebrate because of Christ. And you know this. Some people can only celebrate when they're drunk. Some people can only celebrate when their team wins. Cars are overturned in Columbus all the time. I lived near there in Akron. Uh, clearly, celebration for them was just out of control. For us, it's meant to be a, a commitment to thank God no matter what you're living through because he's Lord and because we have this living hope, it's a discipline of life. Is that you? It's hard for me. I'm too logical at times. I react to emotions sometimes or stuff I've seen in churches or on TV or people. I'm sorry about that. But I know that inside, this is a command for me and every one of us. Rejoice in the Lord always. So celebrate salvation. In the Old Testament, it's really huge. Did you know that in the Old Testament, if you took all the days of festivities and feasts and added all the Sabbath, there were anywhere from 80 to 100 labor days, days you're off and celebrating eating and drinking and laughing and feasting because he's Lord and because we trust him. In the Old Testament, we read some of these verses. The, the, the call would go out, and it was related to salvation. The shofar, the trumpet that they had, would call the people, here we go. We did it with a call to rejoice and, and a number of songs that say that. And what we're saying is, I can't quite put this into words, but I want to say this. Rejoice in the Lord. Christ is Lord. Come on every heart. He's king. The church is set apart to live in the world, experience the same hurricanes that the world experiences, but inside to have this living hope and this sure word of total forgiveness. Rejoice in spite of things. Clap your hands, all ye people. That's Psalm 47. Shout to God with shouts of joy. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You're a magnificent machine made by God. Rejoice. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, the psalmist said. Now, I'm older than all of you, but I grew up at a time when there were some people at the Toronto airport who got into a laughing mood. And when laughter wasn't enough, you, you might have friends who were involved. I think it was a little weird. They barked like dogs. They tried to fulfill all the commands about joy and go extremes in that way. What he's writing to is people that go through their regular life, they're still a carpenter, they're still working in commerce, but they rejoice inside in the Lord. Will you do that? This takes away not all pain, but it takes away all stubborn grouchiness. It takes away all negativity that says this world's never going to get better. Yes, it is. Our living hope is related to Christ whether you're Republican or Democrat, 
And it isn't, isn't it great how all of them rejoice with each other and serve so well together in Washington? But let's go on. When he says this, the whole issue is this constant celebration. People have often criticized Christians for being otherworldly. No, we shouldn't be, but always that's the hope that's ahead. So he says, rejoice. And when they did, they sang. They said, yes. The issue of every culture is different, but inside, the call in our lives should be to rejoice. Woody Allen, the famous comedian, wrote a smart aleck book once about college courses, and he was just having fun, but he said that one of them was called Creation 101, and he said, with field trips. And it was a joke, and it was just for fun, but it's really a good point. Look what God has made. There are sunsets when you can't stand there and say, well, look at that. Well, so what happens now? No, you just say, whoa. You can't always explain what God has done in our lives. Paul said to the Romans two years before Nero, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Whoa. Rejoice in the Lord, even when you're tested. Now, I'll just touch on these, but look at it. It's so clear for our lives, too. Even when you're tested. Verse 7. So that, verse 6, I mean, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Grief, first word, grieved by trials. There's good grief in one sense, but grief is hard. Some of you heard from a doctor recently, grief. Some of you lost people you love. Grief. They are grieved by various trials. A lot of churches have something called grief share, where you come together and share your grief and try to help each other. Christians overseas often can have to meet in secret, still parts of China where that's true. Grief. But he also says, Glory to Christ, or it could be glory from Christ, tested by fire like gold is. Maybe that's you right now. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, just for a little while, you have been grieved by various trials. What's the purpose? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is rest tested by fire, he likens it to gold. Some of you are golden. You've been faithful for 50 years, 70 years, and more. Every test is meant to make us have more muscle spiritually. You have been tested. And at the end, he says, it will result in the glory and honor at the revelation praise of Jesus Christ. My favorite First Peter scholars say, this is praise from Jesus Christ. Whoa. I'm not sure. It's either the praise of him at the end when we get to see him. Surely there will be that. But the way that's written here, it could be that when you go through trials and you still rejoice that he is king, he at the judgment seat at that day, as Martin Luther put it, we have two days, today and that day when you stand in front of Jesus Christ, he will praise you and give you honor because you were faithful. Whoa! Whichever way, it's go through the test still rejoicing and deciding he is Lord. Will you do that? Will you keep doing that? We all know ahead is tough times, 
We all face that. And the reason, finally, is verse 8 and 9, because of Jesus Christ. Watch what he says. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. I've never seen Jesus. I get cynical when people say they just saw him. I know he can appear today. I know he can. But most of these people that he's writing to, Peter had seen Jesus and been with him and had joy because of it. Can you imagine the joy of this Peter whose sissy blood was drained by the time he was 18 and who would say anything he want and always, I think at campfires, the first thing Jesus did every evening was, Peter, did you hear what you said today to those people? Peter, don't, don't do that. Peter, don't chop off that guy's ear. Peter, but Peter was changed. Even after denial of the Lord he loved, he was changed, and he had this joy and love for him. Can you imagine the love of someone when Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? Take care of my sheep. And he says it a second time, and I'm sure Peter got it. Three times he denies, three times the Lord restores him. Do you love me? And I ask you today, do you love him? No, you haven't seen him, but you love him. You read about him. He's changed your direction to life. He's given you joy. You have purpose in life. Do you love him? And he says, we love him even though we haven't seen him. Our faith even though we have not seen him, we believe in him. Of course we do. I've never seen him. You've never seen him. Do I have to prove something? Do you believe in uh, when you drive a beautiful car that there's a maker of that car, even though you haven't seen the factory? When you hug your child or your grandchild or realize what love is in marriage, do you believe in love even though you can't prove it? When you look up at the heavens, do you believe there's a creator even though you can't prove it from, except by faith, accepting the word of God? Even though we have not seen him, we believe in him. And no matter what we're going through, it changes. We rejoice. He is Lord. That's what Peter's saying. Peter watched him live. He said, you haven't seen him, but I want to tell you. He loved people of all sizes and shapes. Children would run to sit on his lap. The lepers had a saying among them, he's one of us. Not because he healed them all, but because he loved them all and touched them. He showed us heaven when he went through hell. He forgave when people killed him. We love him. And whether it's sung as a little four-year-old, Jesus loves me, this I know, or we're sitting there in a grand hall and hearing the hallelujah chorus by some giant choir and orchestra, something stirs in our heart. Yeah, I love him. I celebrate him. And Peter says, no, I, you're going to have to trust me on this, but look around. Do you believe in gravity? You can't prove gravity, but believe in it, please. You can't prove creation, but look around 93 billion light years across. Though you have not seen him, you believe in him. And then he adds this beautiful phrase, verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. That's our joy. What does that mean, inexpressible? Well, I did some writing when I was younger and still do some writing every, every week at least. Some of you are writers and editors. You try, you can put some things on words, but there's some things that are inexpressible, so we sing. We don't have time for everyone to stand up and say something, so we all stand up and sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Your God, adore. 
Rejoice, give thanks, and sing forevermore. Rejoice in glorious hope. The Lord our King shall come and judge. Rejoice. We say it. We celebrate. We meet together every Sunday, first day of the week, because no matter how much death is around us, we are settling everything on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Rejoice. Give thanks. Inexpressible means You've stuttered, I stutter all the time trying to say how much he loves us, me, and you. For God so loved the world, we can say it in our sleep. Do you see what he did for the world? It's joy inexpressible. Rejoicing doesn't mean you got the raise. It means no matter what happens, he is Lord, he is king, and we have a living hope that's as sure as his resurrection and guarded by his grace. That's the Christian mood. It's where we're to be and where we're to live. But it has to be personal in our lives. And he says, he goes on to say, it's a living hope, it's a joy because of Christ. No matter who you are. It's, the outcome is our hope at the revelation of Jesus Christ, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I was at the chapel and I was putting my notes on the pulpit and I looked down, it was like 20 minutes before the service, there were just a couple people in the room and our worship leader's two young sons were sitting right there in the front row smoking cigarettes. They were probably six and four. Now the cigarettes were coffee stirrers. So, but they were smoking them with one hand and with the other hand they were arm wrestling. Their father was up here practicing the choir to get ready for the first worship service. When I put my notes down, I looked and I, I just laughed. I saw my brother and me, because he was bad, and he did, <laughs> did some things that got me in trouble. <laughs> but I just laughed. They were bored to death. Now, I need to tell you, Kenton would know this, and Meredith, that Miller was often saying that in heaven we will worship forever and ever which is true, but let's define worship. But they were bored with this service that very week, I kid you not, that very week, Miller, that's his first name, came into my office, our worship leader, and he said, I gotta tell you a story. I went into Timothy's room last night and he's crying. And I said, Timothy, he's the younger one, why are you crying? He said, because I'm gonna go to heaven. And he said, well, why would you cry about that? He said, because all we're going to do is worship forever and ever. <laughs> he saw himself sitting in heaven while his dad leads the choir, maybe Kenton someday, and worshiping like that forever and ever. No, no. <laughs> if worship is forever and ever, it means honoring him because he's actually present now and we're with Christ forever and ever. And it's pure joy for, and total love forever and ever, and it's wonderful. Is it yours? Celebrate because of all of this. Anybody that grew up in the 50s and 40s and 60s remembers this. It's still important. Our salvation we already have, we're still getting, and someday it's complete. He just said, at the completion of your salvation. It's, not, it's just the beginning when you said, I believe, I accept Jesus as my Savior. That's the start. The continuation is the present. Sanctification is the big word, and it just means more and more growing stronger in your faith and in holiness and obedience. That should be true for me, for you. And then someday, this is what he means here, verse 9, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Whoa. 
That's what's ahead someday. Salvation of your souls forever and ever, meaning the completion of the salvation. You're still receiving it now, sanctification, but someday, glorification. Not just to be with Christ spiritually combined, now walking down the street together, now with him forever and ever. Are you in on that? If you're in on that, it's because you've looked to the cross and to Jesus Christ and said, I believe, I trust you as my Savior and my Lord. Count me in. I will obey you. <laughs> and if it's true, not just on Sundays, but on Sundays, make it a big deal to be here Sundays. On the first day of the week, we're saying, yeah, there's death all around me, and I'm still dying, but I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and all of us will be raised too. When you start your prayer, go P-R-A-Y, praise first, then repent, then ask, and yield. When you talk with someone about what's happening in Washington or around the world or in, even in Florida right now or wherever it hits, there's pain and there's real pain, but we celebrate that he is Lord of our lives. The other day I saw on television a walk-off home run. If you don't know, a walk-off means it's the bottom of the ninth. Somebody hits the, it was a grand slam in that case. They won the game. They come home and the guys don't say, that was a very nice hit. <laughs> They're celebrating. They don't mind showing their joy. That's what heaven will be like. That's the return of Jesus Christ. And so he says to the followers, in the meantime, put celebration in your schedule. Richard Foster, in his book about celebration, as the discipline said, we pray for our food or bless our food and then we gripe about how bad it is. No, celebrate all of life. Put joy in your schedule. Share love with someone every day. Say something about the gospel to someone who isn't sure of it, even if it's just a question. Make the first day of the week a true day of worship as you begin together. The celebration ahead will be unbelievable and forever and ever and good. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul wrote from prison. And because he knows it's hard for us, he says, and again, I say, rejoice. Will you do that? This is an alert to everyone who seems to be negative at times. This is a strong call for everyone who just reads the newspaper. This is a call to everyone who just watches cable news. Stop that sometimes and just bow your knee and say, I believe in Jesus Christ and I love him though I have not seen him and I can't wait. <laughs> In the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, Eric Little, uh, who became a missionary, was a strong Christian, became a missionary to China, a great runner, and in the Olympics in Paris, he would win the gold in his event. He said at the beginning of the book and at the beginning of the movie, I run for God's glory. I feel his joy, his favor when I run. And so when he won the gold, he laughed. <laughs> They hoisted him on their shoulders, his friends, and he pointed to the heavens. He tebowed before it was a habit, and he gave God thanks. The other main character, Harold Abrams, ran for Harold Abrams. And when he won the gold in his own contest race, he went out to get drunk with his coach, Sam Musabini. And the movie shows Sam, uh, Sam Musabini and Harold Abrams sitting here, and he's taking another sip of beer. He is going to get drunk. He doesn't know what to do with the gold. What do you do when you live for yourself? At the end of your life, you've got nothing. There's nothing to celebrate. And the, uh, uh, Sam Musabini turns to him, and excuse my language, but he says, Harold, the whole world can go to hell. 
tell him you won for you and old Sam Musabini, and that's all that matters. But it's not enough. And the camera comes in close, and he takes another sip of beer. There's nothing to celebrate when you live for yourself or when I do. But when we live for the risen, victorious, conquering king of the universe who made it all with the flick of his wrist and will bring it all together someday and us with him, we can laugh and rejoice. He's king. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for Jesus Christ. Please help me and all of us who listen to live for him and to celebrate who he is a day at a time. As you pray, not out loud at this point, but just thank him inside, celebrate, rejoice, the Lord is king. If you're not sure of eternal life and con connection with Jesus Christ, if you're ready, ask forgiveness and say, I want to believe in him and follow him and tell someone today. Thank you, God, for your risen Son, creator of the universe, owner of all that is. And we rejoice in him as Lord. Amen. Let's do that together. This song, as all of them today, says it so well. Rejoice. Why? The Lord is king. Your Lord and king adore. Let's stand together.